Okay, so first if we could just go along and sort of, could you introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about what you do uh, and then we'll get into the debate and talking about it. Me first? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I'm Amber Rudd, Member of Parliament for Hastings and Rye, uh, former Secretary of State for Energy and former Home Secretary. I'm here because I think it really matters that people are aware that we need to get more women involved in politics and they need to understand, everyone needs to understand why that's been a problem, where it came from and how we need to constantly keep the pressure up to make sure that women's representation uh, is kept up and makes progress. One of the things I'm always struck by in terms of uh, women's representation, whether in politics or in business, is that it is a constant battle to make sure that it takes place. You young men and women will look around and you will have a very equal approach to each other, as I did when I was your age <coughs> a few years ago. <laughs> And you will think, well, what is she going on about? Because uh, the man on my left, the woman on my right, we all know we're equal, so surely it will change in our generation. And let me tell you, I thought that 25 years ago, but it's not like that. It's constant vigilance because the default setting is that men will take over. So all you women here and all you men who care about it because you're here, be aware because we have to make sure that as many women as possible always participate and not just participate, but make progress. Uh, a woman who represented uh, an area in Rwanda once said to me, we worked out very early on that if we weren't at the table, we were on the menu. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Helen Pankhurst. Um, I am an international rights campaigner, work for Care International. I'm also an author. Um, I wrote this book, Deeds Not Words, The Story of Women's Rights Then and Now. The whole of my life really has been partly uh, that sense of the link, the heritage, the history of the Pankhurst surname and the link to the suffragette movement um, and an understanding and interpretation of that to reflect on how far we've got and what we still need to do. Uh, to Amber's point, I think uh, a lot of the reflection on how far we've got keeps on showing us how often we think we've got there in a particular area of rights. So often there is progress and then you look more carefully and you see that maybe it's a morphing of rights. So in some areas there's progress and in others those same traditional values have reappeared. Uh, and I think you see that time and time again. And um, from this book, one of my favourite uh, analogies was somebody saying it's a bit like the elastic band. You know, you keep pulling for change. You want society to be more equal. You keep pushing for new ideas. But if you let go, what happens is it defaults back. So I think what we are all about, um, you here listening to stories of the past, we, from different perspectives, also having looked at some of those issues, it's just holding on to make sure that the only time we let go is when we know for sure that things Things won't default back. Hi everyone, I'm Fern Riddell and I'm a historian who specialises in sex and suffragette terrorism, which is something that we don't really know very much about, it's something our cultural memory has forgotten. And this year I had a book out called Death in 10 Minutes, it's the autobiography of one of our suffragette bombers. And it was so important to me that we would tell these stories in the year of the centenary because we forget that this is our recent past. We're celebrating a centenary. It's 90 years since everyone had the vote. And yet for women especially, we still don't, do not understand exactly how we got to where we are. And this makes us ask our questions of, what do you want? How will you protect? How will you fight for the rights that you have? And we need to understand that not every woman, not every conversation we've had about, about our rights has ever been, ever been safe secure or kind. Sometimes those rights have been fought for with violence, just as men have fought for their rights. And we need to understand both of those aspects to understand where we are today. So let's start by looking at the suffrage movement and the issue of posthumous pardons, which the Labour Party have pledged to issue to convicted suffragettes. You said the issue was complicated at the time. Could you tell us a little bit more about it and then we can open it up to general discussion? I have very mixed feelings about the idea of giving posthumous pardons for suffragettes who broke the law. And we all know that they broke the law, but I think most of us look back and say, for good reason, because they were fighting for something we believe in. And I think the idea of giving them a posthumous pardon is a bit patronising. You know, they broke the law and it draws attention to the fact that the law was wrong, that we know that they went through such a terrible time to in order to change the law. And 
uh, you, know, they, we, you know, the Cat and Mouse Act, all these different elements where they had to endure terrible physical deprivation. And I think it is wrong to think about posthumous pardons in those cases. I think it is much more noble and respectful to say they took this on, they changed the law, the law needed changing, and only by their acts did we get it. So Dr Pankhurst, you said that you thought the suffragettes wouldn't want women to continue to look back and dwell on this, but instead to sort of look forward and look to what needs to be done now. Do you think it's an issue worth fighting for? Um, again, I think it's complicated. So I think my first point would be that the suffragettes didn't want to uh, be paid off. So when there was the opportunity to pay so that they were released from prison, most of them didn't want to be paid because they wanted to make that statement that if a liberal, gov a liberal government believed that women should be uh, imprisoned like this, it was what was at fault was that liberal government and that, that, that was a way to draw attention to it. So I think that it's not about a pardon. If anything, it's about an apology the state apologising for its, its maltreatment, its mistreatment of uh, women. Um, but that in itself also, I think, wouldn't be enough for them. You know, I think they would love it that there's so many of this colour <laughs> up and down the country. The Bank of England, would you believe it? The Bank of England today has got the tricolour flag flying and it's lit up with these colours. And so many other places have. And that sense of our culture, our society and some of our institutions saying, you know, we we, we, we admire what they did, we look up to that. I think that's really important. And I think they would love that, they would laugh at that. But fundamentally, they would be saying, what still needs to be done? And I wonder whether we could have some kind of an act in their name. You know, there's so many things that, that could move us forward in terms of gender inequality. And I think if we named that through them or in somehow said, look, we're continuing the work, they would value that a lot more than any, any uh, pardon. I also wondered about medals, actually, because they loved their medals, did the suffragettes. <laughs> and I wondered whether they could be posthumous medals. But no. <laughs> I love that idea, I think that's good. <laughs> if you're going to ask me the same thing, Genevieve, to me, in, in contrast to both our panel members, it's not a complicated issue at all. It's not complex. The suffragettes went to prison because they intended to break the law. They would have found a pardon laughable. And when this suggestion came forward, I was very struck by the fact the Labour Party didn't actually know what they were asking to be pardoned. They didn't understand why many of these women were in jail. And it wasn't simply for marching. It was often for destruction. It was for the bombing and arson campaign. That's what they're asking for pardons for. And we have to ask whether or not we believe those things should be pardonable in our society. That's a personal opinion that you, you each have to think about. But from my perspective as a historian, understanding what those actions were, why they did them, why they felt they had no choice but to leave bombs outside the Bank of England for on one case, mm -hmm. why they felt that was the only way the government would listen to them is really important. And a pardon is not the answer. A pardon is a dismissal of every single woman who in her 30s, in her 40s, in this period, thought, I'm not being listened to. I have spent 50 years, there have my generations of my family have spent 50 years asking nicely, and you haven't listened. There were 16,000 private petitions put before Parliament before 1918 asking for female suffrage. 16,000. And none of them went through. You have to ask what changed. And one of the things that changed was women went, we have had enough. So touching on the terrorist aspect of the movement, the Shadow Minister for Women and Equalities, Dawn Butler, who sadly couldn't be with us here today, at the Labour Party conference said it's better to break the law than break the poor. Do you think um, that the criminal and sometimes violent actions that you're talking about were justified and that it was needed to get the vote? Were they necessary? <sighs> I think that that would be the moment where I would fall on. That's a complicated question. <laughs> but I think we, we've all grown up, everyone in this room has grown up underneath terrorism. We all know how we feel about those actions when they're committed on our soil against the people we know and we love. It's very different when you look back in time and you see that those actions were being committed by other people in your society amongst a group that we idolise, like the suffragettes, who are rightfully idolised. Without the suffragettes, we would not have the vote. We would not have our rights. I would not have my PhD. I would not be able to sit here and speak with you. So were those actions justifiable in the long term? And did it result in us getting the vote? I think you have to look at who was given the vote in 1918. 
The people who got the vote were the suffragettes. They were women over 30 who fitted a property, uh, property qualification. Most of those women are the women who are conducting the bombing and arson campaign. And you have to ask, the government at the end of World War I was going, how the hell are we going to put our society together? And how dangerous will it be if we don't give those women what they want? And that's why I think we have a specific group who were given the vote after World War I. But others may disagree. Uh, yeah, I disagree. <laughs> you go. Um, I think the reason why propertied older women got the vote is that the liberal uh, conservative coalition at the time uh, was worried about young, um, poorer women voting Labour and therefore voting them out of office. So I think it was self-interest that dictated who got the vote. Um, and there were all sorts of ironies about it. So, you know, how could you say that um, it was only women above the age of uh, 30 that could get the vote, and yet, a few months later, women over the age of 21 could stand for Parliament? So you could stand for Parliament that year, but you couldn't vote. <laughs> Logical? Um, in terms of uh, whether the actions were acceptable or not, I mean, for me, I, and we also differ a little bit on this issue of terrorism, in that for me, the state was as much the terrorist in this story. Well, maybe we I don't. I would agree. I'd agree. Okay. So, you know, who, who's, who's undertaking the terror? Is it the, ter is, is it the person who's force-feeding somebody who's asking for a civic voice at a time when already in so many countries in the empire, women were beginning to be given the vote? So is, is it the state that's, the, um, that's, that's doing the... Um, terrorism or is it the women that are doing it without detracting from the agency of women saying enough is enough we've got to do something we've got to do it now and it's our responsibility to do it. I wonder if terrorism is the right word for it though because we're so used to at least I am having you know in, in 2017 we had the worst series of terrorist attacks we'd had in the UK since the Northern Ireland troubles decades ago you know five bad terrorist attacks came at us very quickly and in the UK we very much associate that with uh, people blowing up other people and causing, you know, 36 people died in 2017. But the terrorism of the suffragettes was largely to property and to themselves. But it wasn't, well, I'm sure you're going to fill me in, I'm sure, but, but it, wasn't like, it wasn't the scale of what we saw in 2017 in terms of the terrorist attacks. Just before I hand you back the conch, uh, which is coming, can I, can, can I ask you an, another thing, which is that there, are, there is some arguments, and I hesitate to say this in such august company, but it's partly because I'd like an answer to it. Who, people will say, suffragettes, yes, very much, they did an important job, they raised the profile of the ones, but actually all over the liberal world, women got the vote during that period, so maybe it would have come anyway. I mean, we know that Switzerland was much later and some were earlier, but ultimately it was coming anyway. Is that correct? I, so yeah. there's, there's two things here, and one, again, this speaks to our, how new this history is for us on the, ter on the terrorism aspect. On the one hand, I will fight and argue constantly that we have to understand these actions as they were understood at the time. Number one, when the suffragettes bombed Lloyd George's cottage in, uh, in Epsom, it was published underneath the headlines of suffragette terrorism. That's the language of the time. And the suffragettes themselves, Emmeline Pankhurst and Christabel Pankhurst, both stated in their memoirs the purpose of the bombing and arson campaign was to bring terror to the British public so that they would in, for, in turn force the government to listen. So when you have the suffragettes themselves saying, we are here to terrorize the public, that's what these, are, these specific, the bombs and the arson is for. And you have the press calling it terrorism. That to me means we are simply using the language of the time to understand. And also you have to ask, these are a, a select group of women who were amongst other things, cutting the huge trunk telegram telephone wire posts that took out all communication between London and Glasgow on, a, on an almost monthly basis in some times. And whilst we absolutely today live in a time of terror that causes huge damage, it might interest you to learn that the scale of the suffragettes' terrorism in terms of the amount of bombs that were being left, the amount of attacks, is actually the largest we've ever had in our history. But we never talk about this. But what do you mean and largest didn't kill people? In terms well, that's partly because of the, the way the bombs were put together. So many of the bombs, there's one bomb that's sent to the Southeastern Post Office in London, and it's made from nitroglycerin and gunpowder, and if it, had been, if it had gone off, it hadn't been discovered, it would have blown up the entire building, killing all 200 people inside. This is also a different time of technology. So many of these bombs were on a timed device, which meant that roughly about the hour before they started to go off, they would start to splutter and smoke. We, don't, we often have talked about this violence as only against property, 
Actually, the bombs and the arson campaigns turn up on packed commuter trains. Many bombs are discovered there. We also see them in timber yards and cotton mills. These women weren't attacking just public homes or domestic settings. They were very clear that economic damage was one of the most dangerous things you can do to a government. You attack the economy, you attack communications, and you cause fear. You attack churches, you attack homes, and that's what they felt was a way to conduct themselves. So when you actually strip out the fact that we're talking about women and we're talking about suffrage, and you look just at the systematic way these people were acting and what those actions were, we absolutely subscribe the word terrorism to our understanding of that today. And I, I don't think it's a word we should ever be scared of using to understand actions in the past, because the world we have now, and definitely the world I've grown up in, Terrorism has become something that is the other. It is by people we do not understand, whose understanding of the world is, seems alien to us. It's against our, our world and our society. Well, actually, every single, every single civil rights movement has had an extremist element. Every single civil rights movement. And the suffragettes are just that for the women's movement. But we have to acknowledge it to understand our history in totality. If I can um, move us on a little bit, I mean, my, my perspective on this would be there were a few who were willing to go the whole way. They didn't kill anybody, and that's really important to say and to repeat because of the current newer understanding of terrorism, which by definition puts that first. So as long as we say terrorism as defined by them, which meant that they were willing to attack property, which meant that they got really damn close to killing somebody but didn't, they themselves were killed and injured and sexually abused. So some of them were willing to go that far. Many of them were not, uh, you know, thousands of them were not. And also this suffragist-suffragette dichotomy, it's a lot more complicated. You had many suffragists who were as, as militant as, and many suffragettes who were not militant. So let's get rid of that simple, it was the suffragettes that were the militant ones. It's a lot more complex and nuanced than that. <laughs> But um, the, 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 the second point that you had made was, to, you know, to what extent uh, would it have happened without them? Mm -hmm. And I think my point on that would be that uh, the whole suffrage movement was very global. It was international. They were communicating right across many different countries. Uh, many countries had already started, had been more, uh, less rigid in their ways of thinking and had started to move forward uh, uh, faster. I think what the suffragette movement did was not so much just about the change in the law. It created, they created a conversation, they created a sense of agency of women saying enough is enough and standing up and believing in that and having a vision of themselves. And the idea of women's agency is what they pushed. And likewise, they changed social norms. They changed so much the ideas. So many people started to discuss around many places the idea of women's suffrage. So that's what they achieved. And I think in that respect, what was going on in the UK was a much more richer engagement over these issues. Issues. And it's those women who then became the leaders, you know, in the local council, in religious establishments, in educational establishments, in so many things that then changed the way we look at so many things. So looking at women in politics today, currently only 32% of MPs are female. Mm -hmm. Why do you think women are still so underrepresented in Parliament today? Um, I'd say, you know, it's a <laughs> difficult question to answer. I, I would say that the most important thing to me is that the direction of travel is that we continue to get more women. What I have a fear of is that sometimes there's not enough vigilance to make sure that we get more women in as members of parliament. I mean, it's different in different parties. The Labour Party deal with this by having all women shortlists. And so they're now at 40%, roughly. The Conservative Party takes a different view in that we make sure that when MPs are selected, the procedure makes sure that when the finalists get for selection process by their association. There's half men and half women in the finalists, then we say women will do it for themselves. Um, so Labour's have 40% because they have these all women shortlists. We're at 20%, which is progress, but still woefully low. Um, I would say, um, and, and Dawn would know, would, would respond as I'm sure somebody else can respond uh, in contrast to that, but I think that because we do it organically like that, even though we have less, we embed a much more feminist approach to politicians in the Conservative Party, while I have a fear that the 
Labour way of doing it, of having all women shortlists, means that the women are marginalised, they get the lesser roles, they aren't considered as competitive, but people have different views on it. From, I, I'd see my party and we constantly need to encourage women to come forward. There will be, on any candidates list now, for any Labour or Conservative seat that comes up, there will probably be, if there isn't an all-women shortlist in Labour, and it's just an open list for the Conservatives, three or four times as many men who will apply as women. Um, so the actual business of making sure that women see this as a reasonable career for them is where we have to start. And we have a, an outreach organisation where we're trying to encourage women all over the country to come forward and stand, explain you can start as a councillor, you can start as an activist and then become involved as a member of parliament. Uh, there's various organisations which are cross party. One of them, the leading hashtag is ask her to stand. And we have a big event coming up at the end of November in Parliament where every MP has been asked to bring a woman to Parliament to show them round to make sure that they see this as an opportunity for them. I think it's constant work to make sure that women realise that this is something that they can do as well. And do you not think, obviously you mentioned that Labour have, I think, 52 more female MPs. Do you not yeah. think it's because they take a more inclusive approach towards women or do you think... It's the because they, they take have, is flawed. It's, no, no, it's because they have all women shortlists. But do you think that's something the Conservative Party should consider? No, I don't. I don't, I don't because I don't think you embed <coughs> equality by having all women shortlists. I think you do it by uh, persuading associations and bringing them with you. Um, mind you, I remember saying um, this to a woman of my age when I was much younger, and she said, by the time you get to my age, you'll have changed your mind. <laughs> because it is frustrating. You know, it is still frustrating. It's still, it seems extraordinary to me that at the Conservative Party we're still only 20%. Um, you know, the consequence of that is you get less senior women in senior roles. And we have to constantly stay on it and encourage women to come in. I just, I just don't really like all women shortlists. I find it fundamentally, it, it flies in the face of my view of what equality is. Can I ask, Amber, the Section 106 of the Equality Act, and let me explain that, whether that's something that you would um, endorse and think is a way forward. Uh, so the Section 106 of the Equality Act is something that would that's in the legislation and would require all parties to provide information on people who uh, are candidates. And in a way, it's like it's addressing the pipeline. It's providing, it's shedding a light on the pipeline so that if you know in which areas women are not coming through or people of diversity are not coming through, you have the information then as a party or then um, beyond that party to say, look, why is it in this particular area that there's never been any, anybody of diversity coming through? Um, it's a bit like the, the equivalent, I think, in some ways is the gender pay gap reporting where forcing, in that case, companies to provide information on the gender pay gap has resulted in the beginnings of action because it embarrasses those, uh, part, those um, companies that are not providing that information. And I just wonder what your opinion is but, on but, that. Helen, that suggests there's a problem with, as though we're trying to hide something. I mean, and we're very open about the fact that we want more women to apply. We're very open to trying to uh, headhunt women and get them to come in. And David Cameron started by sort of saying business people should apply. Um, there's, no, there's no inhibition to sharing information about it. What we want is to encourage more women to think it's the role for them. And it is, those of you who've been to Parliament will see that it is quite a male-dominated area and that you know people have to see other women in role model uh, roles in order for them to think this is something I could perhaps do and then people say to me I've, I've been in parliament for eight years have you experienced sexism and I don't experience it directly I just do feel slightly sorry for the men sometimes because they you know they stumble over our handbags they have no idea I'll never forget sitting next to a conservative MP on the benches for the first time and him, you know, wanting to, uh, you know, to, to chat to me and show his feminist credentials and leaning over and said, did you know George Eliot was a woman? <laughs> <laughs> I felt quite sorry for him. Really. <laughs> um, so they sort of try, you know. Can I ask a question to, to both the panel? To my, my, I, so I uh, grew up in Kent and I've recently, after 10 years in L London, moved back there because I think you, you need to return to where you grew up. It's the only way to kind of bring back what's happening. And Kent is a, a well-known conservative uh, kind of stronghold. For almost my entire life, our MP was the same man, same conservative man who just continually got re-elected. Do you think it would be far better and far more and uh, allow us to find more women in our roles as MPs if MPs were limited to only ever serving five years and then not being able to stand for, say, another year or two or three or five years or however long? 
and that that would, if the roles became and the seats became more open and more up for election, that that would see an increase in women. You certainly get a, a bigger swing towards um, getting in more women every time there's a big election swing. Um, so, you know, in Labour Party in 1997, they suddenly got a whole lot of women in because they, they swept the ranks in terms of lots of Conservative MPs being swept out and they had all their women short. So when there's a big change, you're right, you get more women in. The trouble with that is that, um, you know, the, being a politician is a professional role. Um, the, I mean, I don't, you know, other, other roles, you don't chuck people out after five years. I mean, it, it's brutal when you lose a seat, don't I? know I nearly did last time. But um, it's, I don't think, I think, you know, the idea of professional politicians is often knocked, but... These, these are people who become our executive. You know, they go into very senior roles. I think it's a mistake to think that you can have a profession where people go in for five years and go out for a few years. I mean, because people need to build careers. I don't think it's, a, I think it's an unreasonable expectation. I can, I can understand that, but I, I also know as someone who, who grew up in a place where we had the same MP for 25 years, it felt, politics in my county and in my area felt stale. It felt like you were never listened to. It felt like you had no voice, you had no say, because the person in power never changed, never listened, and was, as, as is seen, kind of a, a career politician. It was, he, he, was, he was just standard. It was almost like having a, a, a king, and a, you know, someone you had no control over. And it was incredibly depoliticizing for, for my generation. You only have to look at Canterbury, which in Brexit, was 41,000 for and 41, uh, 40,000 for Remain. You know, we were neighbour against neighbour, you know, family against family in that vote. And it was because there'd been this huge growth in our student community and they were the ones who, who absolutely went to the polls for it. And we saw our, our, our seat shift and we shifted, I think, now to Labour, which is, I think, what Canterbury is now. Fine. And it, it's, it was so interesting to me, having grown up in this one place that had one identity, to suddenly see a shift and a change, because I know it felt growing up there, that that would never happen. And this understanding, or this, the, at least the identity the Conservative Party has had in certain places, and, and up very much at the moment, is one that is totally masculine, which sounds ridiculous having had you as Home Secretary and having a female Prime Minister, that does not listen, that never changes. And I think part of that is because you have these career politicians who do not move for decades. And yet he got voted out. After 25 years. I know, but it does show that there is no such thing as a safe seat, really. I mean, I have plenty of Labour friends in Scotland who had majorities of 15, 20. A friend of mine, Labour MP in Scotland, had a majority of 24,000 and was taken out in 2015. So these things can happen, and, and they do. And it's, I, I don't think it's a really Conservative thing or Labour thing. There's plenty of Labour MPs in, 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 in the cities who've been there with their huge majorities for decades as well. I mean, I think what you're sort of raising is a sort of bigger constitutional question. And personally, I've always been a supporter of a partially elected House of Lords. That might be the place to try and have a bigger turnover of politicians. I, you know, the fact is that I don't think it's, I just don't think it's a good idea to further undermine the role of MPs. Um, you want to get, attract good people into it and that, you know, they do an important job. And I think that if you had a situation where um, you, you change MP every five years in a place, it's not, it's not so healthy. But I, I do think that MPs now are much less likely to take that role, I have to say. And I think you'll find that most MPs now are much more in touch with their community. They have regular surgeries and they know that they can lose to another party. Even if they've got a big majority, these... these these seismic changes do happen. And also there's so much open communication now that if you're not performing as an MP, you know, you'll, you'll find your constituents speak up. In my experience, there's plenty of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Just to end on a positive note before we move to questions from the audience. Um, the suffragette movement clearly left a very important legacy. What can women do now in the fight for equality? What's the most pressing issue and, and what can women do to tackle that? Yeah, I mean, that's something I've been reflecting on a lot, um, and I used the book to assess the rate of progress in different areas, thinking, you know, could we say that we've moved more, say, in politics than we have in economics, or than we have in terms of issues of violence against women, or culture, or, you know, where, where have we moved more most, and where have we moved the least? And I thought maybe by reflecting and actually scoring each of the chapters, I might identify one chapter where 
progress had happened the least and therefore that was the way that was the area to focus on and in the scoring I found and I've been going up and down the country talking to lots of groups and generally there is one area that scores the least well almost everywhere and it's the, it's the chapter looking at violence and in that chapter, I find that, you know, violence has infected everything else. So it infects the issue of politics with Joe Cox and all the Twitter campaign that's particularly vile to women and also anybody else who doesn't quite fit the norm. Um, you know, violence in terms of the Me Too, we know that that's affecting work um, and therefore the chapter on work, it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere. It affects um, uh, issues of identity and family in traditional ways and in modern ways. Look at the culture around us. Violence is the, you know, the the, the sub-themes of so many plots in the films that we watch, in the theatre, in the books that we read. So it seemed to me that although legislation had improved no end, uh, a lot of the support had improved to some extent, but there's also austerity, austerity um, um, meaning that there's certain cuts to the direct support. But fundamentally, I felt that, again, this was one of these areas where things had morphed a bit, and social media and uh, pornography and the whole internet had created new forms of violence, but actually violence was majorly <coughs> problematic. But having said that, there's one area where I thought the, most, uh, the least progress had happened. I think fundamentally, push comes to shove, I believe that individually every single one of us can do things to shift the needle in our own lives, in the things that we do, in our relationships, in the home life, in looking at equality in so many different areas, um, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our political campaigning, and actually there isn't a magic bullet, there isn't do this and everything else will happen. You know, maybe, just maybe some of the suffragettes thought change the political world and everything else will be fine. I think most of them knew full well that that there were many other battles to be held. And I believe, for me, it's about social norms change, and that happens with every, every person having an agency around shifting the needle in the areas that they can control. So can I just add something? I wholly agree with Helen that the, the area that we need to see approve, improvement in is violence against women. And we're bringing forward a new domestic violence bill, but the, you, you, this is a reason why you have to have more women in Parliament, because only when women are represented do you get women's lives taken seriously. Um, the men I know uh, who are MPs, they think they represent women, they think they uh, know how to address uh, domestic violence, but they don't. And you know, Harriet Harman was a great advocate for women's working lives, and she changed the legislation to support women. And most women who I know who come into Parliament feel a responsibility <coughs> to enhance the lives of other women. And so it's, it's, it's part of two parts to this, is that there is still a shocking amount of violence against women. And the best way to improve women's lives is to have to more women represented to think about that and promote the legislation for it. Um, how can you not agree with both of those points? <laughs> um, I, obviously, I agree with, with absolutely with what's both both has been said, I think, but as a, as a, to add, I would say equal pay as much as anything else, because I can promise you when you get to your 30s and you realise the men around you are making more and you are either more qualified or you know more than they do and yet you do not get that payment, you do not get that job and you are expected to work for less and not question it, I can promise you it does not make life easy. And these are the things in every stage of our lives, whether it's violence, whether it's representation, whether it's fairness in being able to be independent, respected and earn what we want to have the lives we want. These are things that the suffragettes and every woman's movement was fighting for a hundred years ago and we're still fighting for it today. So when is it going to change? It's not changing right now. It's going to be changing with you. It's going to be changing in the future. We have to get there first. We're still fighting. So that, that would be where I would be. Thank you. Should we move to some questions from the audience? So if you just want to raise your hand if you'd like to ask one of the panellists a question. Can we go to um, the gentleman in the front row? Thank you. Um, you talked earlier about the masculine nature of the parliament. Uh, but how much of a factor is is the intimidating nature of the parliament in discouraging women to sort of think about having a career in the parliament? And how do you go about um, making it more accessible? Well, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, how is, why is the working environment not conducive 
to women uh, enjoying it and participating. I think we've made a lot of changes, so it is. Uh, we no longer uh, work through the night. <laughs> it's a ridiculous thing to say, but it's true. But, uh, part MPs used to regularly work through the night. It's unusual. And we have less late night sittings. And actually, I say to a lot of women who are thinking about getting involved in politics, um, is that it, it's not a bad career, even if you have got a family, because you have terms, like the same way you have terms at universities. So you can uh, enjoy your family life between terms. But it, it is a slightly odd times in working being a member of parliament but it is if you're a partner in a law firm or something like that i think the worst thing that puts women off getting involved in politics is what helen was referring to earlier is there is particularly high levels of intimidation unfortunately of women in social media and um you know any time any of us do anything we put, tend to put it on social media and the level of hate you get is pretty horrific really so that that's quite intimidating and Oh, that whole area of um, anger and bad temper and increasingly violence um, has been stoked up. It's like been hothoused by social media um, anger, really. And a lot of my friends who are MPs have had death threats. Um, some of them, you know, take them seriously and have reported to police. Some of them have had to have prosecutions in their area. And, you know, it's a very real issue. So. Uh, you know, my view is that as a, as a government and both parties do this is that you have to constantly call it out and you have to say it's unacceptable and you have to, and the leaders of the parties, and to be frank, some better than others, have to call out all violence and say this is not acceptable, this is not a social norm, we should make sure we don't do it. And whenever I go around schools and talk to young women and try and encourage them to participate, sometimes they've made the mistake of looking at my Twitter because there is always really a lot of hate on that. And they look at me and they say, how can you bear it? Um, and I just think that, you know, we have to constantly call it out and say it's not acceptable and support each other as we try and participate. Can we take another question? Can we go to the lady in the front row? <coughs> Thank you. So quite ironically, despite it being a female majority audience, for your first question there, four gentlemen kindly raised their hands to ask a question. Why do you think young girls of this generation are still afraid to put themselves forward and what <coughs> advice would you give them to do so? Oh, um, I think we are taught that women are more quiet, we are more controlled, we think about what we say, we are taught there are gendered ways of speaking in our society. Ignore it. Never, ever lack the confidence you see in your male friends to speak your mind, because that is what matters. Unless you speak, I promise you, someone else will speak for you, or they will think they have the right to speak for you. And I can tell every young woman in this room has thoughts and feelings and emotions that are hers alone, that she knows she needs to share. Well, share them talk about them, argue, fight, be angry, be cross, never be shy with what you have to say. Because it is about making space, never expect a door to be opened for you. That, I think, is what I would Fantastic, really completely agree with that. And support your girlfriends. Mm. And when people make mistakes, realise that it doesn't matter. You know, I was always making mistakes. When you first ask a question, you do your maiden speech as an MP, it is terrifying. And, you know, you do make mistakes. You know, who's the right honourable? Who's your gallant friend? Who's your colleague? Oh, my gosh. So many different norms to remember. But ultimately, you get your confidence because you realise it doesn't matter if you make a mistake, as long as you just pick yourself up and carry on. So I completely agree. Should we take another question? Yeah, lady in the second row. <coughs> Thank you all for your comments so far. I wonder, in many conversations I've had with older women in my life, they speak about fighting particular legal battles in the fight for equality, and obviously we're here today celebrating the 100th anniversary of a legal decision. Um, and today I sometimes feel that a lot of it has shifted to more of a, a cultural issues, and I wonder if you could speak about how it's possible to have a direct action, or um, a coherent direct action in that area when sometimes it feels as much it's just personally calling things out or that sort of thing. So a campaign you're thinking of? Yes. 
What are we camping on now, Helen? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, you know, for me, it's the links between all of these. So then so many stories of an individual person standing up and believing that something's not right. And then um, now through this uh, business that if, you, if there are more than 100,000 people that campaign about things, then Parliament has to debate it. And I think that's a really powerful way of linking the, uh, the political change, the kind of the legal change with the voices of individuals. Um, but I think there's, there's, there's so many areas where you see that being played out um I mean, which I think the thing to do is to find out what you care about passionately and use that as the launch bin for, for so much. And, you know, is, it, is cultural less important than political or legal? I'm not convinced that it isn't. You know, voice, what that, that earlier point was about voice. Voice is political. You know, everything is political. And if, if you are silenced even before you express yourself because the structures of society tell you your voice is less important, then, you know, we've already, we're already losing the plot, I think. Um, which campaigns do I particularly like that are going on at the moment? Um, there's one that's literally just just started, as in today, which is you know that two percent of the um, uh, two percent of the tax to social media organisations that was announced in the budget yesterday. Well, a number of people have suggested how about if one percent went to address violence against women, particularly on Twitter. We know this is a problem. We know that social media is the platform that creates a lot of this. And how about 1% of that going to address violence against the women? So there's a whole set of people that are starting a campaign on that area. Uh, but I think, you know, there is so much going on. I think it's what, what do you passionately feel is important and, 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 and do it, because um, that's the only way things are going to change. I've got time for a couple more questions. Just wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, hi, um, thank you for your talk. So my question is about um, how women in politics are usually portrayed. And there's very, most of the women who are in politics, they, they need to be very masculine, in not in just the way of the way they speak, the way they do carry out things, but also in the way they look. Um, from, well, the ma major examples from Margaret Thatcher to Indira Gandhi, they're, they're both just, they call the iron ladies, right? And they have to be very um, masculine in the way they do, they do things. And I feel like it's still very true to this day as well, um, that women in politics need to be a bit more masculine, or like if they're feminine, then they won't be taken seriously. Um, and I know you discussed that briefly as well, but I'm just wondering if, this is ever going to change, or if it is changing, because I just don't see it happening at the moment. Do you, or if you think it's even an issue, or what are your comments on that? I, I, I mean, I've heard that before. I'm not sure I really agree with it, um, because it's, it's, it, it's like anything we were saying earlier. It's about confidence, really. I think you can, um, you know, you, you, people don't necessarily wear suits. They can wear what they want as long as they feel formal. There's been there's quite a lot of debate about Prime Minister's questions. Because those of you who've seen Prime Minister Questions know it's quite a bear pit. And when I first went in and I sat there and I thought, my God, they're all screaming at each other, waving their papers. I'll never be like that. It's disgraceful. Now I'm the first in there waving my paper, yelling across the next person. Um, I don't think it's particularly uh, masculine or feminine that. I think it's just um, a lively debate. I mean, we have an extraordinary system. In, in the UK in our parliament and PMQs, and it can get a bit out of hand. But I tell you, uh, visitors from other countries come and they see the untethered nature of it and the fact that anything can happen, but the prime minister has to answer, and every day it's a different secretary of state. They are in awe of the fact that it's so transparent and that anybody can, any who's person an MP can challenge a senior person like that. So I don't, I don't feel that it's like that. Um, but uh, if it looks like that, I think it's probably because it's just so many more men than women in there. But perhaps also there are expectations of femininity that I don't share. Um, you know, that I, I don't think that, I don't know what other people think about femininity, but perhaps, perhaps there is a sort of, perhaps you think it's masculine because everybody's being strong and bold and shouty at each other, but I can be just as strong and bold and shouty as the next person. We were actually talking about that before when we, we in were in academia yeah. um, and how sometimes you're expected to be masculine to be successful. I know you had some interesting thoughts on that. I, yeah, I thought there's a, someone told me that they were told to write more masculine, to be taken seriously. And I was, I was livid 
to hear this response that a young woman would be advised to, to write history in a more masculine manner because I can promise you some male historians cannot write for toffee. Mm -hmm. And also, if you believe that writing in a masculine way simply means be confident, be clear, be precise, be strong and be passionate, well, I can count w the stars for how many women I know who fit that category. That, um, that is not a masculine or feminine thing. That is simply a person thing. So this idea that we have about gendered ways of being, gendered language, what, what makes you someone who should be taken with authority is something I've spent my whole career fighting against. I, I will always fight for that stridently, but I have to say I have experienced it myself. I work mostly in the media as a, as a historian uh, on screen and as a consultant making specialist factual and drama and pretty much everything that you see that's culture-based. I was told by one of our most important channels when I was a PhD student that I would never be allowed to present until I had my PhD. And when you look at every female historian who presents, what do they all have in common? Susie Lipscomb, Nina Ramirez, Lucy, me, everyone else, we all have PhDs. Do you know who doesn't? Dan Snow, Dan Jones. Every single man on your screen does not have a PhD in history, apart from Niall Ferguson, but we don't count him. <laughs> so we are still looking at a divide between what we think means a woman has authority. And for women like me as experts, we have to have our qualifications because otherwise we aren't taken seriously. And we're still fighting that battle today. Now, personally, people will then say, well, should you have a PhD or shouldn't you? And I will always fall down on anyone should have their qualification. You should be that defined aspect, that defined expert, whether or not you're a man or a woman. But we're still fighting for it as women. Oh, if I can add just a few short thoughts. My first thought as you were asking the question is that quote from Michelle Bachelet, who talks about a few women in politics changes women, lots of women in politics changes politics, which would be kind of your, your angle on it. And, and then I was thinking, you know, it feels to me like the whole structure is still so man-made. In so many ways, we haven't had enough, the idea of difference and transformation that having two lenses rather than one lens could create on all of this. And, you know, you see that in things like the fact that it's only very gradually that some of the simple HR processes within Parliament are coming through. You know, women um, MPs are still not given uh, maternity leave if they. If, you know, it's a, some of the basics that you would want to in a in a 21st century institution. So, I still feel that there's a lot around that whole system that needs that needs to, needs some shaking up and that needs two lenses rather than one on it. Um, and that's about valuation of all of this as well. I think that there is, that the, the, the whole valuation system is, is warped and it's also an economic valuation system. And why or why are nurses and teachers and all the people who are doing the caring, why does society not value that as much as a, an engineer and a, a financial analyst? The, the, the economic valuation of what we, we look at, I think is still problematic. And, and those are the things that we need to fight for. I think we have time for one more question. Go to the green coat. Hi. As someone that sat in tutorials over the past year and a bit, I've noticed that girls tend to, who are equally as clever and qualified as their male colleagues, tend to qualify statements by adding, I don't know, or I'm not sure at the end. And I was just wondering, how do you think we can bring up young girls from like, formative years so that they have confidence and self-belief to present their ideas and have that confidence. Call it out. Yeah. Keep calling it out. Yeah, that's it. Call it out and make fun of it. And uh, just, 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 it just, we've got to give the young women the confidence to realise that they're wrong about that. And it's also, I think, as, um, as was said, it's that business about social norms. It's as though women are supposed to talk with a slightly quieter voice. I mean, first time I started doing political commentary, um, a, a senior member of the cabinet came up to me and said, oh, I heard you on the radio yesterday. You were very feisty. <laughs> feisty, it's a particularly annoying word. Uh, a word only used for women, I felt. But he didn't use it again, I can reassure you. <laughs> 
<laughs> you just have to point it out and call it out. And, and maybe this business about being braver, you know, remembering the suffragettes and all of their <laughs> bravery. And, and um, so a friend of mine said that they, were, they had, a daughter, they had um, kids and it was a superhero dress-up thing. So they dressed up the daughter as a suffragette, as a superhero. You know, so somehow remember, you remember their power, their belief, their energy, their fun, their whatever you want to call it. And... Um, I think those are good role models. In many but ways. it doesn't start when they're very young. I mean, I did see, I don't know if anyone else saw that series of videos about asking girls to run like a girl. And the very young girls ran hard and fast. And from the age of about nine or 10, the girls then started making fun of themselves, running all wobbly and sort of with high heels and stuff. So it is a learnt behaviour. And I think that sort of example about calling it out and showing that this is an absurd response will help to make it, to change it, I hope. We will only get there by changing our culture. And that means education as much as anything else. And I, I mean, I was always opinionated and stubborn and felt I should share that and, you know, you had to like it or lump it. But I know from when I was an undergrad at, um, at Royal Holloway, women, young women learn as students to speak for themselves. You're learning now in any of your seminars what, how to have your, your opinions heard. So never be shy if you start by simply asking a question in seminars, if you stop yourself from quantifying it. And never ever be embarrassed or ashamed of asking a question you think might be stupid, because I can promise you, someone else has already thought of it. They're just too shy to say it. And it's up to you. You have to be brave in your everyday life, even if all it is is asking a question. But have the power and faith in your conviction that what you want to say has a right to be heard more than anything else. Thank you very much for that question. Can we all join me in thanking our guests for being here tonight? <laughs> <laughs>